I'm going to do a little intro. Then uh, John Heasley of uh, Vario, and uh, who's also channeling Hank Kilmer, an old friend of many of ours, um, who has sick dogs and didn't come. Um, we'll talk about kind of the operator view. Phil from Juniper. Um, we'll talk about the current internet draft in the ITF um, by him and Rob Enns, who's also wandering around here. And then Andy Bierman, who's one of the chairs of the uh, ITF WG. We'll talk about where things sit in the ITF. Um, <clears throat> by network, what happened in the ITF is uh, a couple years ago in a March meeting in Minneapolis, it was very cold. and. Uh, the network operators were saying, the network management people, um, um, I don't mean the people with suits and pointy heads who run around the top of my company. I mean the um, people who do SNMP and network management workstations and stuff like that, kept saying, why are you operators complaining? And what do we really need here, et cetera? And uh, I uh, said, how many operators are there in this room? There were about 30. And I said, of all those operators in this room, with those who have SNMP set enabled, please raise their hands, and none did. I.e., nobody's configuring routers with SNMP. Um, the man man net management folk, of course, were shocked. There's an exception, which is Doxis modems, by the way, are uh, SNMP managed. But for the most part, people are configuring routers with a CLI. Um, the there are two flavors of it. Um, this is what smart people do, which is um, sneeze. We'll see if I can stop it. They uh, take data, which is defined either the global routing, both the global global routing registry and their local database, which is um, I call it the local routing registry. But what's configured? what my customers are, what their address space is, et cetera, et cetera. And you run some code, and you generate the configurations, and you blow them out to the network. <clears throat> there is a very common opposite practice, which is you have people that you um, hired in from Starbucks who keyboard to the routers and change the configurations continually. And then you wonder why your network doesn't work. Um, this is very common. It's especially common in the large telcos, where the price of an engineer is considered more important than a running network. And um, they have a saying, the network is the database of record, i.e., these configurations are the real network. The stuff we have in our database, well, we try to keep up with that. Um, and this causes um, long-term problems. Um, so we're trying to come up with why and how you configure your network. And um, Woody did a draft operator requirements document. And it had some good stuff about uh, the command language interface, using text, um, secure transports, et cetera. But it was kind of a small operator view, not the large operator view. And, and the joke that we started circulating around IETF it's the CLI, stupid. But why was it the CLI? Why is the CLI what's important? And it's mostly because text, the CLI is text, and text is universal. It's malleable with lots of tools. I can send it by email to my friends. I can run grep on it. I can generate it with disgusting languages like Perl or M4. OK. It's also the CLI wins because the vendors take five years to get the MIB done for a new feature. But for them to test their new feature internally themselves, they have to hack it into the CLI. So when it ships in beta, I've got it in the CLI. I don't have it in the MIB. So the IAB, the Internet Architecture Board of uh, the ITF, held a little workshop about oh, 15 months ago with some network management people, some operators, some protocol people, et cetera, et cetera, to try and sort out what the threads were here. The result was an 
X, was a XML-based effort known as XML-Conf. There was a design team within the ITF. This is the first draft to come out of them. And there's a working group in the ITF. And that's currently the state of play today. Um, I personally just want to push a high-level vision. I'm interested in configuring networks, not just devices. So this leads me to things like transaction models, right? There, there, there's usually two routers on the ends of a link, not just one. And I need to configure them both. And the problem cascades through my network. When I want to change my routing policy, I want to change it in my entire network, okay? Security, identity, authentication, authorization, where the administrative and security boundaries are in my network, trust of peers and registries, these are the architectural issues um, that I think I need to solve. Um, the, the, the language issues are what we focused on so far and how to achieve these. Um, I think next we've threatened to have John Heasley up and I'm going to have to do some laptop manage magic to make this work. Uh, I'm not really much of one with PowerPoint or anything like that, so this is the best you're going to get. Black and white and, and some web interface. Volume? Closer? Better? All right. Um, so I guess my purpose is here to, uh, uh, based on my experience having automated a bunch of stuff for Vario and, uh, and some other companies, to express what my opinion is about, uh, and I hope I share it with a, with a lot of other people in the field, uh, what we'd like to see from an XML configuration interface, or more precisely, a, uh, a management interface that is programmatically um, run or, or defined. Uh, so, and you've all heard this before, I think, in one way or another, especially if you visited uh, any of the or seen any of the drafts or visited any of the working group meetings. Um, as Randy mentioned before, everybody did everything directly on the router. Uh, and in the long run, you pay for that. You pay for it dearly. Uh, when there's a problem, you can't do anything but panic. And you have no canonical config to, to refer to. So what is correct and what is uh, what is an error that has been introduced and generally introduced without your knowledge? Um, so as you hit these problems, uh, it's going to be fairly obvious that that this doesn't scale, as Randy always says. Um, you're spending the, more, the majority of your time fighting problems than you are supporting your customers, adding new features, and generally managing all the other things you need to do. Uh, so one way to, to break out of that, and I think that a lot of folks have done this, is to start generating your configs, which is uh, what Vario does. And I hope that a large uh, majority of, of ISPs do, because frankly, if you don't have generation, if you don't have this kind of management, 
you're going to lose. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, so what we've done is we have a, a database back end. Uh, we have a bunch of homegrown tools. The tools that are coming from, uh, or in the past have come from uh, companies uh, working towards this market have really missed the mark. Uh, they don't have the flexibility. They don't have what we want at all. And the number of companies doing that is fairly small and probably growing smaller, I would gather, uh, at least from the service provider's point of view. The enterprise eats this stuff up. And companies like Juniper and Cisco and, and so on, I don't see how they could uh, they could really avoid getting involved in that to some degree uh, because the enterprise likes the HP Open View, the SNMP manageable, or rather everything is a GUI management system. Um, and that just doesn't work for, for the provider generally. Right? Your NOC needs to have those kinds of tools, but you don't really want them to be configuring your network. So uh, you have to provide what, what the actual uh, managers of the network are doing, or want rather. Um, and I think that that is simple tools, uh, almost grassroots, if you will, uh, nothing overly complex. And it really doesn't need to be overly complex, uh, sort of beauty and simplicity. So we take all these, uh, these database entries that define our peers, um, MSDP, general things about a device, and we build complete configurations for those devices and push them out onto, uh, onto the device when we need to make changes. And never use write-mem or uh, what is the other Cisco fee, uh, command to save the configuration. Um, I forgot what it is. But anyway, write-mem, uh, we perform daily tasks that are all scripted. Uh, we perform our own monitoring, consistency checking between the devices and the database and vice versa. Um, and I think that really the important part to take away from a, a lot of this is that not only is it automated, but we put the data in once and it comes out multiple times over and over again to serve for input to various tools. And you reduce the number of discrepancies that you introduce into, into uh, your network, as well as uh, the amount of work, the investment that the operators have to make in order to, uh, to make the network run, function properly. Um, so we do, let's see, eventually, um, what do we want? Well, we don't want some massive system that we have to not only manage the network, we also have to manage this monstrosity of a, of a management system like HP OpenView. Great thing for a NOC, doesn't work for, for doing network management, especially not, I think, from the service provider point of view, um, and certainly not from Vario's point of view, and I believe a lot of people uh, in the industry share that opinion. And we'd like to avoid the different interface for every single vendor problem. Yeah. And I think that one way we can do that is a lot of these, um, a lot of the things that you have to do, or rather configure on your devices, uh, is the same for, for all of those devices that use a particular feature. Be it BGP, for example. They all have peers. They all have policy. Granted, the policy knobs, uh, the way you configure your policy is different on each device. But from where you start, those can all be done the same, in the same way. The same kind of syntax, which can be translated to the vendor's, uh, the vendor's format. So, while a lot of vendors will say, we want, uh, we want to be able to introduce our own features, we want to differentiate ourselves from our competitors. That's fine, but for these things that are common, common between all vendors, I'd like, I want to see things that are. Uh, or that can be done generically, right? I can configure a BGP peer generically. It has an IP address, it has uh, a policy, it has um, a source address, whatever it may be. Uh, 
Uh, there are a lot of things that are compatible along that. Same way, you know, every car has a steering wheel. It might be on a different side, but they all have steering wheels, and we can all drive that car when we get into it. Um, so, what do we want out of uh, a network management system? We want that programmatic interface. We want to replace screen scraping. The screen scraping doesn't work. You spend a lot of time uh, keeping up with vendor changes. Um, you know, the wild cowboy development engineer that changed a field to have a colon on it now. Well, you didn't anticipate that. And even if you are a regex god, it's not going to work. And you spend a bunch of time trying to, to fix that problem, and it, it was a complete waste. You could have done something else, played golf, whatever. Um, but one thing to recognize, I think, on that is that the CLI has access to everything. It has um, more data than you can get from SNMP. There's no interest in replacing SNMP. It has value. We don't want to uh, necessarily use XML or whatever that uh, this programmatic interface might be uh, to replace collecting statistics from interfaces. Um, I think that that would be a little bit more expensive than, than SNMP is at the moment. But we want to be able to access all this data. You want to be able to access the, the configuration the, all the data that comes out of uh, show interface, for example. And that is possible, I think, because all the data is already there. It's just a translation mechanism within the device. So Cisco gives you a show interface, and it's in one format. Almost all, or perhaps all that data is available in the Juniper, for example, and vice versa. It might be slightly different format, but if I can get it in, in some kind of a programmatic interface, then I don't have to screen scrape, and I don't have to follow every single version of the operating system for that particular device. Um, and I don't want vendors to choose my transport. I don't want to use SSL. Um, I want to use SSH. I want to use Telnet. I want to be able to configure it over the TTY. I want my wire monkey to go down to the pop, push that box into the rack, connect his laptop to it and run, run a script that configures it enough so that I can access it. Um, I think the important thing there is that in the previous draft, I think it was Woody's draft, he says, well, I don't want to use FTP. I don't want that to be um, accessible. And I don't really want them to choose my transport. Let me make my choice for what fits, uh, what fits my needs, right? If I have, uh, sorry about that. If I, uh, if I want to use FTP and accept the consequences, then that's my prerogative. And I don't want the vendors to choose the language that I want to use, which is where ASCII or uh, just text-based comes in very useful. I can manipulate it with whatever I want, awk, Perl, C, doesn't matter. It's up to me. It's, this is just a way to uh, format the data that you're going to put into it or take out of the device. And if at all possible, I want it to be uh, human parsable. I want to be able to read it. It certainly makes debugging a lot easier when I can just read it directly rather than translating bits. Um, and in some cases, one even wants to type it in manually. So things like XML that are purely um, purely text-based fit that requirement very nicely. It's very handy to be able to do that manually. Um, and let's see, and one of the other things about, uh, about SNMP, I forgot to mention, is that, like Randy suggested, it takes forever to get that, that MID through the IETF and then implement it on the, on the devices. And I don't know, how long is it going to be before it breaks? Certain vendors seem to re break that repeatedly. I can't live with that. Um, if XML is, or this interface is just a, simply a translation, I'm, I'm hoping that that'll be more reliable in the long run. Um, and the other thing I'd like to be able to do from, uh, from an interface like this is I'd like to be able to connect to a device, 
I want it to tell me what kind of device it is, what version it's running, and or be able to query that. And, uh, and I'd like to be able to uh, decide how I'm going to translate the data that comes in or goes out to the device. So if I connect to a Juniper, I know it's a Juniper and I know I have to use a certain translation. It tells me, but the mechanism that I get that information to make my decision is all uh, generic. I can connect to any device and it's going to tell me that. So does, does XML provide that to us? certainly seems to. It, um, it has the capability to, to give us all of this data. And it gives it to us in a format that we can, we can parse. Um, and Juniper's made a considerable effort at, uh, at implementing this, and they've done quite a, quite a good job. Um, is it necessarily the best way to do it? I, I couldn't say. Uh, others have suggested SOAP. I can't say if that's a better mechanism. Uh, having looked at it only briefly, the, uh, the libraries that I had seen available for, for SOAP uh, weren't that impressive. So while XML has uh, a plethora of, of libraries and, and they're for all, lang all different languages, there's C, there's Perl, there's Python, so on, there's a certain momentum here. We have a lot of this stuff already done, and one vendor's already in, implemented it. And with uh, with momentum, there's uh, perhaps some acceptance. Uh, so um, I hope that other vendors will uh, will embrace that. And hmm, how to exp how to express this. Uh, We'll see a lot more tools that are going to uh, arise that already have this support, and and maybe uh, not every ISP, every user will have to invest the time uh, into developing their own. But with the momentum, I think that that'll uh, I think that'll take off. Uh, let me see. There were some other notes that I had here. Um, oh yes. The, uh, the one thing I think we need to see about XML is how the other, uh, these other vendors will accept, uh, number one, what has already been done, and probably number two, how they will, uh, if and how they will accept generic interfaces and this translation mechanism. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Hi, um, uh, my name is Phil Schaefer. I'm with Juniper Networks. I'm the software developer who did the, works on the uh, XML API for uh, our, uh, our boxes. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, um, the, the draft for the NetComps uh, um, protocol. Uh, there's a design team that worked on this. Uh, it's folks from Juniper, folks from Cisco, folks from Wind Run River, um, and some others. Um, what we see is the, the key part of the strategy is to leverage uh, what, what folks have, what vendors have in the CLI to expose that, uh, those capabilities and the, uh, um, as, as, as easily as possible um, and, and to bind the API to the CLI as tightly as possible so that when a feature is available in the CLI, it's available in the API. Um, we use XML for this because it's uh, it's a 
great way to carry data. Um, it's uh, it's not only uh, uh, useful in our uh, problem domain, but it's it's used in all sorts of applications for interchange uh, between databases and applications. Um, there's a, a powerful technologies for doing data transformations on XML. Um, XML is is text. It's it's easily parsable. If there's bits you don't care about, you can ignore them um, without having to update your parser for every every release of the vendor software. You 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 may not understand the bits that you're parsing, but you can at least parse them and and either discard them or uh, or retain them. Um, this is my version of Randy's slide, sort of, uh, where you have uh, you have software that's maintaining databases of of your uh, of of um, your your basically your network definition. You can pull that you can pull that data out into vendor neutral configuration. You can uh, run it through transformations uh, that may be vendor or product or release specific to generate configuration that you uh, that you then uh, hand to the hand to the box. Uh, and the uh, so NetConf is really uh, concentrated on um, getting uh, configuration onto the box in a in a simple programmable manner. Um, the protocol, uh, you know, four basic areas of features. Um, the protocol has has multiple channels. Uh, there's a management channel for controlling. Uh, operations. There's an operation channel that carries the actual content um, as RPCs, uh, and there's a notification channel for carrying uh, asynchronous messages from the uh, from the device back to the management uh, application. Um, the the management channel can can uh, can kill a session or abort a a, a current uh, an, a, an RPC that's in progress. Uh, the RPC mechanism is is fairly trivial. You send an RPC uh, XML element, you get back an RPC reply. Uh, on the management channel, you can send, uh, you can receive uh, progress indications, and you can send abort and uh, receive in response an abort reply. Um, the the protocol is designed to be able to transport over uh, any to to be carried over any transport, including SSH, SSL, uh, beep, SOAP. Doesn't matter, or, or uh, raw terminal device, uh, uh, console TTY. It shouldn't matter what's under uh, what's under it as long as it meets a um, a base set of requirements, uh, which are spelled out in the draft. Um, the protocol has a capability exchange where, at the start of the connection, you uh, each party gives a list of capabilities that uh, it, uh, um, it it. The, the capabilities that it understands, uh, the overlap the, the, uh, of those two uh, capabilities uh, are considered to be the um, what can be used for for during that conversation. So, if, if the client understands locking and the server understands locking, then any of the locking RPCs can be uh, requested, and any of the responses can uh, uh, and, and and the the uh, appropriate response is expected. Um, the capabilities can be versioned. They can be uh, standard, proprietary. Um, the uh, base capabilities are uh, concentrated on configuration, get, set, copy configuration. There is a mechanism for getting state information just because it's convenient. Uh, when you're when you're you know when you're configuring interfaces, it's convenient to be able to get a list of interfaces. Um, the uh, draft defines a, a number of, of capabilities. Um, uh, no, the notification is a is a capability. Um, so both sides have to express their their ability to uh, manage the notification channel before the channel can be opened. Um, and there are a number of there are a number of capabilities that that we feel better express how uh, devices in use in the network operate, um, like. Um, candidate configuration, separate uh, startup configuration. Um, the um, 
you know, m m the majority of, 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 uh, of boxes in your network have, have a model where they have, uh, they, they, they may have a candidate configuration, uh, they definitely have a running configuration, and they may have a separate startup. Um, the, the ability to access these is determined by capabilities, so you can generically say, you can gener generically determine whether your box has a candidate configuration, in, case, in which case changes made to the candidate configuration uh, have to be committed before they before they're affect the operation of the box. Um, and uh, there's a capability for startup configuration so that um, you'll know that if you're, ma if you're making a change to the running configuration, it has to be uh, saved to the startup configuration. And that's all I got. Let's see. I think I can dig Andy out. I <clears throat> asked Phil if he can dig up some examples while Andy's singing his song. Let's see. Then there's somewhere here there's a full oh, the slideshow. Yeah. Andy, you're on. Oh, you got slides. Yeah. Well, do this. Then let's go to some hardcore examples. And then hopefully people out there, the coffee will have settled in and somebody out there will wake up. Hi, my name is Andy Berman, and I'm uh, the uh, co-chair for the NetConf working group. That's the effort that started up in the ITF for, for this. Um, so the goal of the working group is to create a standard for, for programmatic configuration, and we really want to make sure that it's something operators want to use and vendors are going to, are going to implement. I've been doing uh, SNMP for a lot of years, and so I'm very uh, aware of you know, what can go wrong and the, the divergence of, of what operators want and what vendors were working on and the IETF was working on. So, so we're kind of starting fresh here and, and hoping that we can get operators really involved in the process so, so that we'll end up with something that they'll want to use. Um, and I don't know how many of you here are involved in, in ITF working groups. Uh, I know it's, it's no picnic. It's a lot of times it's a, it's a contentious, it's a lot of effort. Things take way too long to get done. All those reasons why it's easier to just work on your network and, and forget about it, but I really hope that that uh, we can get some people here to to participate in, in the mailing list and, and even attend meetings. Um, so here's the working group details. If uh, I, I think my slides will be online later if you want to get them from there. Or, and there's already a mailing list and an archive. and. Um, so, and one more plea to, to get involved, read drafts, even participate in email. You can even send an email to the chairs and say, hey, your, your group is, is getting off track. Well, I don't know why they're talking about WSDL on and on. We don't care about that. So, so we want to hear those kind of comments. Um, even if you don't want to send them to the group, you can send them to the chairs. So. So this slide kind of is taken right from the charter about some of the things that the, the protocol is supposed to be able to do. Um, for, you know, supposed to be able to retrieve uh, configurations, be able to, to keep configuration data and state data separate from each other. That seems to be important. A lot of, a lot of times uh, diff tools show false positives because state data is included in the configuration. We want to avoid that. Um, it needs to be extensible enough so that vendors can provide um, their own additional configuration knobs and we can build on standard configuration. It needs to be a programmatic interface to get away from screen scraping. Everyone agrees on that. Um, use textual data. That seems to be a really strong requirement that keeps coming back to us. Uh, supporting existing authentication mechanisms. This is still not, it's not clear how we're going to exactly do this to support the same sort of uh, authentication 
um, that that's used for CLI, but we need to do that somehow. That's one of the, the goals of the working group. Um, also, to integrate with database tools. Uh, I think there's a lot of XML tools that let you do this. I don't know if we need any special support in the protocol or if just, you know, that will fall out for free, but hopefully that's, that's, that's a goal as well. Um, we want to be able to support network-wide transactions. First, we need to, to figure out exactly what this means. If it means just configuration and uh, locking and rollback, or if it needs to be uh, something more than that, you know, that's an explicit goal to be able to, to make it easy to configure something across multiple boxes and, and have it all take at once or all back out at once. And also, we want to provide for notifications somehow, this, this came out as a requirement during the BOF, that people don't want to use a separate mechanism to receive like SNMP traps and then do their config through this. They want one protocol to be able to send um, notifications as well. So, so now I go into some of the issues that are kind of already decided in the charter, see what you guys th think of them if we've made any mistakes here. First of all, it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. You know, we're sending unicast messages, probably over TCP, definitely connection-oriented, and, and the tr transactions are synchronous, although you have this ability to get progress reports that Phil was talking about. Uh, and either end can initiate the connection, so a device can connect to a manager, it helps get around uh, um, firewall problems and that sort of thing. Um, it's definitely session-based, so we want to be able to set up uh, configuration or per session configuration parameters, security in use, the capabilities exchange, these sort of things uh, get done once at the beginning of the session instead of on every transaction. And also the operational model is fairly important that we be able to to define features that can be extended in the standards group over time and also vendors can add their own extensions and you can identify these extensions by uh, capabilities exchange uh, this is, you don't have to have a big, a big offline database that says for this particular version of that particular box, I can do this to it. We want to be able to get those capabilities in line in the protocol and, and instead of maintain a, you know, a data store of all that. So, some more issues already decided, you know, not set in stone, but for the working assumption is that they're decided is that we want to be transport independent as possible, uh, but we're assuming certain things about the transport, like it's connection oriented, and we want to be able to take advantage of security features in the transport layer and not reinvent all the security mechanisms of the application layer like SNMP did. Uh, there's going to be, I guess, some issue here of whether or not we're going we're to standardize any transports that, that aren't secure, like uh, Telnet. I don't think we're going to do that, but that's you know certainly uh, uh, so, you know something that can be added on if someone really wanted to do that. Uh, we've already decided to use XML for the data encoding because it's a good balance between machine and human readable, and also, but it's it's not. Uh, we don't want to exclude the possibility that that you know router or CLI chunks can be moved around with this protocol. So there's. There's a notion that we should be able to use XML wrapper to send CLI text. Um, it's, it's not likely that, that vendors are going to just cut over to a purely uh, you know, XML-driven uh, configuration for, for all features. That, that's just not realistic. So we have to be able to, to phase in the, the XML um, versions of the config. Uh, so. So a way to do that is to be able to move, you know, CLI around in, in the protocol as, as well as XML versions of the config. Uh, probably the most important design decision that we made is to not work on the data model right away. So we will identify data model issues that affect the protocol, things like uh, namespace management and, and other things like uh, what, what uh, you know, if there are naming guidelines or XML usage guidelines that we want to put in place. But the, the working group is not going to define standard 
data models for like BGP and, and things right off right off the bat. Hopefully, this will happen in the IETF. It'll happen in in uh, you know various vendors doing their own XML. Um, I understand. So, so the big red flag here is is that this protocol is not going to do everything from from day one from version 1.0. Uh, so there'll still be proprietary content around for a while. Hopefully we can work out the protocol issues, how to how to manipulate configs in a standard way, and then it'll be uh, easier to figure out, uh, start standardizing the data model. Um, one of the reasons for keeping it separate is it takes forever to get stuff standardized in the IATF. And don't think for a minute that just because we moved to XML instead of SNMP that it's going to go a lot faster to get all the vendors in the room to agree on what the knobs for a certain feature are. That seems to take a long time. Uh, hopefully we can figure out how to speed that up. But you know, So there's always going to be a lag between standards-based management and proprietary configuration. I don't, I don't see that going away. Uh, we can try to reduce the latency, but um, it seems to take a while to get, to get the standards out. Um, and we also decided that we're probably going to use XML schema to def define things like the, the initial data types and the uh, initial data modeling language. But, but again, the, the actual contents of the data models is, is still TBD. Um, and if you think we should start working on that right away, then you should tell Randy uh, to start working on that, you know, get a working group going. Some of the stuff that's still completely up in the air is, and needs to be resolved is, you know, by the working group. And by the way, the working group hasn't actually uh, started yet. This next meeting will be the first meeting, the one in Vienna. Although there's been a fair amount of, of mailing list activity, there it hasn't officially started yet. So, so some of the ideas for transport mapping is, is uh, to use BEEP, to use SSL, to, to use SSH. These seem to be the three leading candidates. Well, we want to make the protocol as transport independent as possible so that it can be mapped over different transports as needed. Um, and we're initially, the XML comp draft said we'd use BEEP, and we backed off of that when the worker group was formed and said we'll, we'll still need to decide that. Uh, the RPC layer seems to also be controversial. Some people want to use SOAP. Some people want to use the RPC that's in the XML conf draft. Some people just want to avoid the terminology RPC and call it a simple request response. Um, we don't know what we're going to do there yet. Another, another big issue, and I think this is one of the biggest ones, is uh, the advanced XML features. Because this really depends on, on the, the tool sets, so the kind of starting point for, for the operators. Of, of what kind of tools they're going to use to manipulate this stuff. I agree that it should be as tool neutral as possible. You should be able to use any language, and, and that's why I favor using plain uh, um, XML, as, as plain as possible, and not relying on WSDL um, templates and fancy features like XPath filtering within, within the uh, protocol. Um, but we'll need to decide that. Uh, the protocol operations has been a subject of discussion and haven't really resolved what we're going to do there. The, the, the way to do add, modify, and delete, um, I won't go into the details, but there's various ways to place that into the XML and, and ha what ramification it has on the granularity of operations and, and such. So that needs to be resolved. Certain things that are advanced features that we currently have as optional, some people think should be mandatory. Things like the ability to do checkpoint and rollback, the ability to do locking, and what kind of locking people, some people are saying we should, we should do granular locking so you can like lock just the BGP uh, config and, or lock just interface Ethernet zero, something like that. That's, currently the thinking is that we'll just have a monolithic lock and a lot of people either like that or don't. So. That seems to be fairly controversial. Uh, Multi-device operation support. We think this is just checkpoint and rollback and locking, but we we need to look into this further. See what you know if there's anything else we need to do to support the ability to to push changes out on multiple routers and have them all take or all back out 
and kind of reasonably at the same time. Um, the error handling, I guess the, the format of error messages, how, how detailed they need to be, uh, you know, any things, special features like rollback on error, so you automatically leave the router in the state it was in when you started working on the config if, if some part of it doesn't work. That needs to be worked out. And also the notifications. Are we going to use something like uh, the secure syslog in RFC 3195, uh, which is, runs over beep, or are we going to use something else? So some people want to use uh, the fine notifications that are, that are in this protocol explicitly. So that's pretty much all I have. I was hoping there'd be some feedback from the group on which way we should go on these on these issues. So, if anyone has any comments? Let me know. Questions and everything are welcome at any time. Um, we're going to try and th throw, throw, find a mic. Microphone. Um, it's kind of, you know, informal participation, so no one's formally signed up do anything. There are uh, large service providers. SPC is, is very active in this and, and some others as well who are interested in seeing this happen. So in lack of questions, I'll give you some of my poison of answers. Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do in this effort is a serious step without going beyond what we know as engineers how to do. Um, so it's stuff that's near to what's already being done. Um, there are efforts underway in Juniper, Cisco, Procket, et cetera, et cetera, in this area. As operators, um, I'm interested in that I can have my same back-end tool set, as Heasley says well, and, and generate a canonic configuration and then target the various vendors' variations of how they describe BGP. Do not get fooled by XML. It's just a wrapping language. It's just a way to tag data and marshal it. It doesn't have any magic about any of this. So it's the combination of XML, transports, and then the model you put over it. How many people here work in an environment where some significant aspect of their router configurations are generated automatically today. That should scare the hell out of you. I mean, all the other people here are your peers, and they're generating routes coming towards you God knows how. Um, the, the, the problem is it's not easy to do today. Um, when I left Vario, where I worked with these and uh, Andrew's around here somewhere where this Vario system came from, um, I expected to find the Vario was kind of in the middle of the pack. I, one other place I visited, a very large telco, where maybe 20% at most of their configuration is generated automatically. The rest is manual. And they had some of the top 
routing researchers of the world, scraping router configurations from the network, and writing programs to check them for consistent routing policy. Um, I said to the head of networking, this is like doing brain surgery with a proctoscope. Um, you've got the wrong end of the animal. Generate consistent routing configurations. Um, and as you try to scale, and as we try to scale our mutual network that we all run, um, you know, this is where incidents like the 7007 disaster, et cetera, came from. So, so Andy, what are you doing? You darn near got it. I'll bring your laptop over here. Andy, you mentioned something about, uh, I'm not sure I caught the entire comment, about not doing Telnet. Can you explain that further? Because it's simple, it's always there. It's kind of like TFTP, right? You well, don't want to use it, but sometimes it just works so well. Right, and some places I can't. Um, the, the reason we would not standardize Telnet as a transport is because we wouldn't get it past the security ADs and the IESG. That'd be the first reason. But it's already a standard. <laughs> what? All you're doing is standardizing a data stream, right? I'll tell you what the fantasy is. The fantasy is that if he says he's using that this protocol must be used over an encrypted transport, that this will get past the security people. Of course, this tool, this tool set over which this is being transported, has in the ITF protocols no way of saying down a layer, by the way, are you secure? It's not there. Dr. Bellavin. Speaking as one of the security ADs who won't bless Telnet for transporting something, you know, we're, I can't correct the sins of the past. I can sure stop new ones from being committed in that. I can't stop somebody from doing something stupid. I can say, if you're going to provide a facility, at least make it possible for people to do things the right way. If you want to transport this over Telnet, I can't stop you. If you want to go turn off the security uh, and use null cipher with SSH, I'm not going to stop you. Publish your private key, but I want to leave, make it possible for people who want to do it right to do it right. Agreed. The, the, the Telnet thing is just a quaint little thing. Is when we first get these strange routers and things, the only transport they tend to have turned on is Telnet. So when I want to shove the initial configuration down it, and of course, then there's the friends in Washington D.C. who won't let mean, nasty other countries get any encryption. Mike, just keep going, they're figuring it out. Okay, I'll just speak loudly, there we go. Um, as in the security AD for you? HP, David Riach, uh, I can't agree with you more. Um, we're not gonna allow Telnet, that's for sure. It doesn't matter, the, it's not a good argument that that's the way everybody does it because we, we can't make our security rules based on the way everybody does it because that's not necessarily the right way. So we're not gonna allow that stuff to trans, uh, transmit across the network in the clear, the configs, let alone the passwords, etc. We're dependent on the devices as well to get the right kinds of uh, communications that will support it. You know, right now we don't have a good SSH implementation on our boundary devices and things like that. So we've got, this is a discussion that is part of the IETF working group that we're having here, but we do need to move away from the mentality of that's the way we do it, that's how everybody does it, is a telnet, with all due respect. So. I didn't say that. I said when I get that router, that's all that it has on it, and I've got to shove an initial configuration up it. In this particular case, all you're giving me is data. Don't make the choices for me. I'll make my own choice. Make me aware of, of what's available. It's, I mean, that sounds like drug policy in this country. 
right? Stop making choices for me. Give me the information I need to make my own choices, and and from there, um, that's how you you educate the people, and then they can make their own choice. Whatever works best for them at that particular point, right? Well, there's a trade-off between flexibility and interoperability. As a vendor, we can't put, you know, seven different transports, uh, you know, for this protocol uh, on the box. We'll put we'll be much more inclined to get you know, multi-vendor interoperability if we standardize a select few. And if people want to deploy uh, you know, this protocol over Telnet, then I'm sure they will. If they want to deploy it over HTTP without SSL, I'm, I'm sure they will. Uh, but it doesn't, there's a difference between vendors providing this and the ITF sanctioning it as a standard. It may be a subtle difference, but it's, it's fairly important one. Okay, I view it as you all right, so now I log in and I have slash bin slash CLI, right? That's my shell, as it were. Now I log in and I have bin slash XML and that's my shell. However I log in, it's that's my decision. Does that make sense? Right? You're well as if if you're using a tool to get to get into the, uh, into the box using this protocol, um, the vendor has to implement it. So, so if there's no agreement on what to implement there, um, then then you you have to, you know, this is all ad hoc. There's really no standardization involved. Um, you know, I think the market will dictate if if there needs to be a lot more. Uh, transports or not. You know, I, I fully expect people to do this over HTTP with, without, without SSL because, they, because they're already doing that. Uh, but but it's, it's not the same to say the IETF standard way to do this is just do whatever security you want, we don't care. Because the security ADs care and they have veto power over the document. Um, so, so the, what, did you want to go to this, uh, the, the examples I got at it? I don't know if they're even up to date. Before. Just one, one more comment, please. Um, I may be speaking from a narrow perspective and that of the enterprise, but from the perspective of the enterprise, uh, for my enterprise's liability perspective, I, it it's, behooves me to not allow that type of transport across my network because it increases our risk of liability if that information is exposed to the public in any way, whether it's typically would be from an internal um, capture of the data being put out on a, on a news board or anything else. So my perspective may be narrow, but that's what the enterprise has to deal with is we have to limit our liability. Yeah, I think the ITF position is usually in this area to be uh, to force vendors to supply a secure path, but they don't force operators to use it. It wouldn't be impossible to do, and wouldn't make sense. Um, so, uh, Phil, did you want to go over these examples, or? or? Um. So here's some uh, some examples of the protocol. Uh, this one is a get configuration uh, from the um, the uh, running configuration. Uh, you, you're getting a bad echo. Bad echo. You're getting a a subset of the configuration given by uh, identified by a hierarchy of configuration. In this example, the the users tag says get me. Um, Get me the uh, uh, the user's subtree of, of the configuration. You can put an arbitrary um, uh, hierarchical path of configuration in, in that um, in that configuration tag. Um, the format can be either uh, XML uh, or text. Uh, text will give you the whatever the native format of the box is. Um, XML will give you the configuration expressed in hierarchy of tags. Um, 
Um, so the reply for that from that RPC would be uh, something like this, where you have the we have the um, reply configuration tag containing um, the you know, requested subset of the configuration, the sub the subtree. In this case, it contains two users, one named uh, root, one named Fred. Um, to change the configuration, you do an edit uh, edit configuration RPC, um, targeting the running configuration, uh, some of the options you can provide, um, the format that you're providing the configuration in, and then under the configuration under the config tag is the the subset that in this case you're replacing. So you're replacing uh, an Ethernet interface with um, with this uh, specific data. Um, there's also a copy config RPC that copies from a source to a target. Uh, you have to identify the uh, format of the configuration. The source and target can be URLs or the running or uh, candidate or startup configuration uh, or local uh, local configuration and a named configuration database. Um, there's also uh, state operations. Um, in this case, you do a get state. You identify in the in the state element what piece of state state uh, uh, what piece of state information you're after. In this case, the interface, the statistics for interface Ethernet zero one in XML. Here's the results of that RPC. Uh, the results of an, R an RPC or an RPC reply with a matching uh, um, ID attribute. Um, and the hierarchy mirrors the hierarchy in the request. Doesn't seem to be. There's a, there's a delay. Talk loud. Oh, I'll just talk loud. That's OK. Oh, good. <coughs> So, Phil, back a couple slides. Since Randy said questions were okay anytime. Anytime. I've been meaning to ask you this several times. Um, so, when we put ours together, as you know, um, we had just not edit, we had replace as well as edit. And I just wondered why that didn't occur to you guys. Because um, you said, you know, perhaps you just want to replace a section instead of edit it. Right. It, well, it, it comes as the as the uh, as the replace write option under an edit configuration. Right. That okay. So you put it. Uh, some of this is as an option in the edit. Is is a option in the edit instead of the other way around? I just wondered why you did it that way instead of the opposite. Nothing other than Nothing. we just took two yeah. different ways to get to the same path. Okay. From this example, one of the things I wanted to point out is that's completely an open issue. Is is see that interface name equals Ethernet zero slash one? That's that's you know just the author's choice who did the slide. I think it was me. But there's a lot of different ways that you can do naming inside the XML, and, and I think part of the standard has to be uh, uh, you know what are we going to do for for standard data models. For you know how how to do that kind of naming, does it, it impacts the authorization model for the security, and uh, so it's it's kind of relevant to this protocol. More questions? <clears throat> well, let's break twenty minutes early. Oops. <laughs> <laughs>